1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Paul says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Dear Holy Father, we thank you once again for your word. We pray now that as we all come to it, to preach from it and to study it, we pray that we'll, have, that we'll allow your word to be the final authority, not us, not our opinion, not our own you know, hunches and opinions, but what your word says in plain English and black and white on the pages of our King James Bible. We pray, Lord, that as we do this, that we'll be careful as always to give you all the glory and praise and that the saints would be edified. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So we've come down now through verse 9. Okay, We started our study of 1 Corinthians together. and We started, obviously, at chapter 1, verse 1. And over the past about two months, we've come down through verse 9. Okay, Now, verse 10 is going to be a turning point in what Paul is going to be saying now to the Corinthians. But before we get to that, I just want to review just a few points. If you would, last Sunday we looked at verse 9 where it says, God is faithful by whom you, are, by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son, um, His Son, the, uh, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I've got four things I want to point out to you in, by way of review from last Sunday from our consideration of verse 9. The first one is that it says right there that God is faithful. And we looked at and we studied how we can trust what God says to us because God is not a man that he should lie, okay? God cannot lie according to First Timothy chap- or, sorry, Titus chapter 1, verse 2. And so we looked at the statement that God is faithful. We understand that God can't lie. God is not a man that he should lie. And therefore, if God tells us he's going to do something, can you trust that he's going to do what he says he's going to do, okay? Then he goes on in verse 9, he says, God is faithful by whom you were called under the fellowship of his Son. The second thing we saw is that God called the Corinthians into the fellowship of His Son through the preaching of Paul's gospel. And we went over to the book of uh, Thessalonians where Paul talks about how people are called by His gospel. And, and when the gospel is preached, it has the capacity to turn the lights of the understand, to reach into the darkness of the lost man's heart and mind and to turn on the light of truth and understanding and give that man or that woman the capacity to choose to believe in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we talked about that aspect of verse 9. Third, we looked at where it says, God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. God has placed us, thirdly, in the intimate fellowship and communion with His Son, as well as the rest of the members of the Godhead. We went over that last Sunday. We looked at 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, where it talks about how we have communion with God the Holy Spirit. We looked at Philippians chapter 2, verse 1, where it says we have fellowship by and through the Spirit. So we, we, there's, we, we compared that to Israel's situation where God would commune with Israel on the top of the mercy seat in the most holy place once a year. And we, we made contrast and comparison between Israel's situation, living under the law, and our situation today as members of the church, the body of Christ, living in the dispensation of grace and being under grace. And we saw that there are no curtains separating us from the presence of God, that we are in Christ and Christ is in us, and we share in the glories of Christ's exaltation, and God the Father, through the preaching of the gospel, called us into the fellowship of His Son. And when you're called into the fellowship of His Son, fourthly, you are called into a fellowship that the Godhead has already been having amongst themselves since before the foundation of the world. So we, we, what Paul's talking about there takes you all the way back and places you into a fellowship between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit that they were enjoying from eternity past before the world began. And now through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the, and the gospel of the grace of God, you are placed into fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You have communion and fellowship with God the Holy Spirit. And God Almighty did all of this for you and I through the work of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Now, as we think about that, verses 1 through 9, and I said this to you at the very end last Sunday, verses 1 to 9 conclude the opening portion here of 1 Corinthians. Okay, We'll have more to say about that in a minute. But as you look now to verse 10, I want you to look at the first few words there. He says, now I beseech you, brethren. Okay, So what he's going to start doing here in verse 10 is, is he's going to begin to make application. He's going to begin to beseech the Corinthians to a particular manner of, to a particular walk, 
to a particular way of doing things that is going to be, and they're going to be beseeched on the basis of what he's already told them. Look at verse 10, he says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So I want to talk first about that, the first part of that verse, where it says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The, the, the thing, as I've already mentioned, I just want to say it again, this phrase where he says, now, he, so he says, now I beseech you. So he's been teaching for nine verses some doctrinal truth, and now he comes to verse 10, and now what he's going to do, Paul's going to beseech the Corinthians on the basis of what he's just told them, on the basis of the doctrine that he's just taught them and reminded them of. So it signifies, verse 10, the shift here. Paul is going to begin calling the Corinthians, as I said, into a particular course of action, i.e., he's going to begin making practical application of the positional doctrine that he's already taught them. Verses 1 through 9 are about here's who you are in Christ. Okay, What verse 10 is going to begin is a stream of thought where Paul is going to beseech the Corinthians on the basis of that established positional truth of who they are in the Lord Jesus Christ, how they ought to think, and how they ought to walk as members of the church, the body of Christ. Now, I want to point out as you look at verse 10, that as he begins to do this, the specific language that he uses, he says in verse 10, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, who is doing the beseeching? Paul is. Who is he beseeching? He's beseeching the Corinthians, and is he beseeching them on the basis of something? Okay, so it's Paul beseeching, the people he's beseeching are the saints at Corinth, the Corinthians, and in that, the beseeching that he's doing is by something. It's, it's on the basis of something. And it says there in the verse that it's by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the issue of beseeching. If you look up the word beseech in the dictionary, the English word beseech means the following, it means to entreat to supplicate, to implore, to ask or pray with urgency, followed by a person as I, Paul, beseech you, by the meekness of Christ, as in 2 Corinthians, and this is the dictionary's definition, it actually is using 2 Corinthians 10, or by a thing, I beseech your practice. Now, if I'm going to beseech you, if I beseech my children to listen to their mother, what am I doing? I'm asking them to listen to who? What if I say, I command you to listen to your mother or else? Is that different? Now, ought a child listen to their parents? Okay? Ought you and I as a member of the church, the body of Christ, live a, live a life that is in line with who we've been made positionally in the Lord Jesus Christ? Okay? So the, uh, the issue of beseeching here, the first thing I want you to see about this word, beseech, is that this word is consistent with grace. If I'm going to beseech you to do something, am I ordering you and commanding you on pain of punishment to do something, or am I asking, begging, or imploring you to do it because it's reasonable for you to think about it that way or to do it that way? There's a difference between ordering and commanding and what? and beseeching and asking, right? So the first thing I want you to see about this is that when Paul beseeches them here now, on the basis of the doctrine that he's taught them, that this is consistent with the grace of God. Paul is not commanding the Corinthians to do anything. Rather, he is begging or pleading with them to consider a particular course of action. All right. Now, should the Corinthians want to do these things out of the love of Christ constraining them to do it? Okay, and you know as well as I do that you get more you get more benefit and a greater willingness on be, on the part of people to do something when you ask them as opposed to when you what command them to. Okay, so Paul is 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 having he's using that type of language. Okay, the second thing I want you to consider about this word beseech and the idea of beseeching is that as the definition indicates. Uh, beseeching is most often done on the basis of someone or something. Okay? Now look at what that verse says. He says, Now I beseech you, brethren, what's the next word? By the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So when Paul beseeches him here, who, what is he beseeching him by or on the basis of? He's beseeching him on the basis of who? 
the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So most often when you see this language in Paul's epistles, you need to look for and ask yourself, what, is be, what are the people being beseeched on the basis of? So let's look at a few examples of this. Uh, come with me to Romans chapter 12. Most of you, when you hear the word, when you hear the word beseech, what's the first verse pops to your mind? It's probably Romans 12.1, right? I beseech you therefore, brethren, and so forth. So let's look at that one first. To what, Romans 12.1. Now, understand... When you get to Romans 12.1, are there 11 chapters that went before? Okay? In those 11 chapters, is Paul teaching all sorts of doctrine to the Romans. He's teaching about their justification. He's teaching them about their, their, their position in Christ. He's teaching them about a lot of things. In chapters 9, 10, and 11, he's teaching them some dispensational truth about what happened to the nation of Israel and so on. And when you come to chapter 12, verse 1, he says, I beseech you, therefore, what? Brethren, so in other words, on the basis of everything I've already said, I want, I'm beseeching you, therefore, now watch the next part of the verse, by what? The mercies of God. So what I want you to see there is that when Paul is beseeching the Romans here, is he beseeching them on the basis of something? This time, he's not beseeching them on the basis of the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, he's specifically beseeching them on the basis of, or by, the mercies of who? God, that ye present your body as a living sacrifice. So anytime there's a beseeching, okay, you should look for a few things, or a few ingredients, if you will. Number one, somebody's going to do the beseeching, okay? Number two, the beseeching is going to be done on the basis of some, someone or something. Number three, there's going to be a call to action that's associated with that beseeching. Notice the verse again. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, what's the next word? That you what? That you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So is it, is it reasonable and acceptable for a member of the church, the body of Christ, to, to present their body as a living sacrifice? Okay? How do you know that? On the basis of everything he just said in chapter 1 through 11, he comes to chapter 12 and he's going to beseech them on that basis. Come with me to chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. Look at verse 30. Verse 30, he says, Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's what? Sake. So there it is again. You have Paul beseeching. You have him beseeching them for something. Now look, look, at, look at the rest of the verse. Um, I lost my spot, sorry. Verse 30, Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, and for the love of the Spirit, there it is again, that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for who? So there's, there's, the, there's the beseecher, there's the beseeching, there's the, the basis of the beseeching, or, or what, 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 the, what the beseeching is based upon, and then there's finally what they're being beseeched unto, or what they're being called to do through the beseeching. Let's go to look at a few more of these. Come to 2 Corinthians. Come over to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Now, Paul uses this word all through his epistles. We don't have time to look at every one of them. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. We then, as workers together with him, do what? Beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. So there you have the same thing. This time... It is Paul beseeching them on the basis of the fact that their work is together with Christ, that they receive not the grace of God in vain. Now, the, the statement is a little bit, it's in a slightly different order than the first two we look, that we looked at, but all of the essential ingredients of a beseeching, if you will, are all present. Come over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Come over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Look at verse 1. He says, furthermore, furthermore then, we beseech you, brethren, comma, and exhort you by who? The Lord Jesus. So all I want you to see is that number one, beseeching, is, the, is in line with the language of grace. 
Paul is not commanding. What he's doing is he's, he's saying, look, you need to consider this point or this, this thing or this course of action because it is in line with who you've been made as a member of the church, the body of Christ. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present. So there's a beseecher, there's a specific beseeching, and, there's a beseech, it's, and it's on, third, it's on the basis of something. It's different, a little bit different every time. And then fourth, there's the course of action or the way of thinking or what have you that they're being beseeched unto. Come back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. So in, in our text this morning, the person or the thing that the beseeching is by or through or on the basis of, if you look at verse 10, he says, I, now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So they're being beseeched. Paul is beseeching them on the authority of the name of who? The Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, why? Why would he, why would he do that here in this case? Is he beseeching in this case based upon the mercies of God? No, he's beseeching on the basis of, of what authority? The name of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? Well, think about it with me. Go back, to verse, go back to verse 1. Given the context we've been studying, it makes sense that Paul would beseech them in this fashion. The first nine verses, in the first nine verses, Christ is mentioned or alluded to in almost every verse. Look at verse 1. Paul called to be an apostle of who? Jesus Christ, through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother. Look at verse 2. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place, call upon the name of who? There, there, there it is again. The name of who? The Lord Jesus Christ, or the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. So Christ is mentioned in verse 1. He's mentioned in verse 2. Look at verse 3. Grace be unto and peace from God our Father and from who? The Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 4. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by who? By Jesus Christ. Verse 5, that in everything ye are enriched by Him. Who's the Him? Jesus Christ. In all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of who? Our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 8, who shall confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless when? In the day of who? Our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 9. God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ, our what? There's only one verse in the first eight verses that doesn't explicitly use the name of Christ or allude to Him by referring to her as a Him, excuse me, referring to Him as a Him. Um, and that's verse 6. No, that... 5, excuse me, yes, yeah, says Him there. So when you get down to verse 10... And he's going to beseech him now on the basis of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It makes sense that he's doing that in this context because what has he been teaching them for nine verses? He's been teaching them that everything that they have, everything that they have been given in their, been given in their spiritual life is associated with the work of who on their behalf? Christ. And so now what he's trying to do in verse 10 is after he's called their attention to what Christ has done for them, what he's doing in verse 10 is he's saying, look guys, on the basis of the established position that you have in the Lord Jesus Christ, and what God has done through you in Christ, now what I need you to do is what? Read the rest of verse 10. That, there be, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind, and in the same what? Judgment. So the beseeching is on the basis of everything that he's already said in the context, okay? Now, well, I'll hold off on saying that. Look at verse 10 again. Now, I beseech you, notice what he calls them. What does he call them? He calls them brethren. Notice, notice that Paul calls the Corinthians brethren in verse 10, thereby indicating that they are Paul's brothers and sisters in Christ, okay? Okay? Paul uses the word brethren 28 times in 28 verses in 1 Corinthians to describe the relationship he has with the Corinthians. Now, are the Corinthians involved in all sorts of sin? Yes. We're going to see in chapter 6, they're involved in sin that isn't even named among the Gentiles, right? But Paul consistently 28 times calls the Corinthians his what? 
his brethren. Okay? He views them as saved. He views them as sanctified in Christ Jesus, as verse 2 says. He views them as in the same eternal position that he is in as members of the church, the body of Christ. And so he says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so what's going on here is that as fellow brothers with the Corinthians, Paul is going to beseech them to a particular course of action, not order or command them. Okay? Now, this beseeching is going to be done, as I've already said, based upon the positional truths of who the Corinthians are that are in Christ that have been established in verses 1 through 9. Now, let's look at the, verse, let's look at the rest of the verse. He says, verse 10, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. What's the next word? That. So, when you see that, it's going to tell you the purpose and the intent of the beseeching. Okay? We've looked at the beseeching is by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is doing the beseeching. What you have in the second half of this verse is the, the specific thing or course of action, if you will, that Paul is beseeching them unto. He says, and that there be no, I'm sorry, and that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, how many of you read that verse and you're like, whoa? What's that mean? Well, does that mean that everybody in, the, in, in, in Grace Life Bible Church is, is all going to say the exact same words in the exact same way all the time? Is that what it means when it says speak the same thing? No. You know that's not true. So we have to do some work here on trying to understand what this does mean. Now, it's interesting as you look at this statement and Brother Bud mentioned this in Sunday school this morning. Look at how Paul says this. He says that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you. What are the two things there that if you think about what he's saying, you can, you can pinpoint as problems in Corinth? There's number one, there's division, and because they're division, are they all speaking the same thing? No, okay? So the not, the, the not speaking of the same thing is a, is a byproduct of the fact that there's what? Division. Now watch the rest of the statement. Semicolon, he says, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. Notice that there are two issues there that he's beseeching them to, and then at the end of the verse there are two issues that he wants them... So there's two things they're not supposed to do, right? They're, they're not supposed to be speaking different things, and they're also not supposed to be uh, engaging in divisions, right? But what are they supposed to be doing at the end of the verse? They're supposed to be perfectly joined in the same mind and the same what? Judgment, okay? That's what Paul here is beseeching them unto. Now, so the first thing that Paul is, is addressing here, let's, let's break this down. Of the, two, of the first two things there, he says again, ye all speak the same thing. It's interesting. The word speak occurs 60 times in 57 verses in Paul's epistles. Okay? And the word occurs 25 times in 25 verses in 1 Corinthians alone. This issue of speaking, let's, let's, let's look at this just for a minute. Come over to Matthew 12. Come over to Matthew chapter 12. Does God care about your speech as a believer? He does, right? Now, I understand that where we're at right now, Matthew 12, this verse is written to the nation of Israel in a, in a different dispensation under the law, but there's a spiritual principle here that, <clears throat> that I think applies to us today just as much as it does to, the, to, to these folks back here. Look at verse 34. O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak what? Good things. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth what? Folks, do you realize that when you speak, your speech... We did, uh, some years ago now, uh, a lot of you weren't even a part of the assembly. I did a whole series on um, the weight of our words, talking about our speech uh, and so forth. Those studies are on the internet if you're interested in ever listening to them. But you can tell what's going on in the heart and soul of a person by listening to the way they what? Talk. Okay? If all you hear is vulgarity and profanity 
and negativity and condemnation and so forth coming out of somebody's mouth, that is a barometer to what is going on where? Inside, right? And, and that, that's what this verse is saying. It says, For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. How does Paul want the Corinthians to speak in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10? He wants them to all speak the same what? Thing. He wants them to speak the same way. He wants them to speak about the same things. And, and that, that, that's what he's talking about. And there's a principle here that our speech says a lot about who we are and what's going on in our spiritual selves at a particular time. Come over to Ephesians chapter 4. This was the text passage that we used some years ago when we went, looked at that series on the tongue. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31, he says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all what? Interesting. How many of you would care to tell me how you're doing with that verse? I certainly would not want to talk to you about it, right? But look at what it says. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all what? Now, is that, that type of speech, bitter speech, angry speech, okay, uh, wrathful speech, clamorous speech that's seeking to, you know, uh, 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 engender doubt or, or you, you know, you're talking about somebody or something behind their back and you're not addressing the person or the issue that you really have an issue with, right? Um, all, that, all that type of evil speaking, cursing and so forth, Paul says, put it away from you with all what? With all malice. All that stuff would not be speech that would be becoming of a member of the church, the body of Christ. But then look at, look at verse, uh, th uh, verse 32. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath what? So you see that there are, some, there are some patterns and manners of speech here that Paul says are unbecoming for a believer, right? Those are identified for you there in verse 31. In verse 32, what he's saying is, look, here's... It, so in other words, if, if what you're saying... Look, go back up to verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of what? Edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Folks, the, the ultimate test for the things you and I say ought to be is what I'm about to say, does it minister grace or not? And if it doesn't minister grace, and if it doesn't serve to build up somebody else, you know, your mother told you when you were a kid, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Right? Well, where did she get that from? Maybe she got it from the Bible, I don't know, but does, is that idea found in that verse? He says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of what? Edify. Now, if there are divisions in Corinth, okay, if there are dissensions in Corinth, if there are contentions in Corinth, and he's telling them that they need to all speak the same thing, it's pretty clear that at least what that means about speaking the same thing is that the Corinthians are speaking things that serve to edify, not what? Divide. Okay? That their speech needs to be, verse 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. How do you talk to your wife? How do you talk to your husband? Your kids? Your boss? See, the Word of God has a way of reaching right into where all of us are and reading our meter, doesn't it? Okay? Now, I'm, I'm, making, I'm making some practical application here because I think we need to do that from time to time. But Paul is very clear here. Come back with me, if you would, to, to 1 Corinthians. It seems to me to be reasonable to think, and I'm, I'm putting something off. I'll, be on, I'll just be upfront about it. I'm putting off saying something. I don't wanna, I'm going to make another point later on about this speech thing, but I don't want to make it yet. Yeah, I don't want to make it at the end. So. But it seems to me that at a minimum, when he says there that, we all, that, we all, that you all speak the same thing, that he's talking about at least speaking to each other in a way that's in line with what? Grace. That's in line with building up and not tearing down. That's in line with seeking to edify, not destroy. Look at verse 10 again. That ye may all, that ye all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you. Now, go 
Come with me to 1 Corinthians 14. We're going to look at a verse that's in the context of spiritual gifts. And I just want to make a point for your consideration, okay, about this verse. If you were to go, if you, if you look out along among the landscape of, of, of Christianity out there, would you say that there's a that there's a great evidence of believers speaking the same thing? Or would you say that there's a distinct lack of evidence of believers speaking the same thing? Okay? Is there confusion out there within the church at large about doctrine and about who they are and about what God is doing today? Okay? And you know and understand, at least from my point of view, that the reason for that is on account of a failure to rightly divide the word of truth. To understand what God was doing in time past, to understand what God is doing today in the dispensation of the grace of God with the church, the body of Christ, and what God will yet do and accomplish with the nation of Israel out there in the future. Look at this verse with me, if you would. 1 Corinthians 14, look at verse 8. It says, If the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to what? Folks, if you listen to the doctrinal speech that's going on out there within the church at large, are we certainly giving an uncertain sound? And one of the reasons why there's a lack of clarity on how to respond to things like court rulings and decisions and how to respond to things that are going on out there in the culture is because the church at large is not speaking what? The same thing. There are, there are things that, there are divisions, there are contentions, there are things that are going on. Now with that in mind, come back to 1 Corinthians. I want to say that. I say that to you because I think it's something that you need to consider, right? But I also want to say on the heels of that, that if you look at verse 10, contextually, is Paul speaking about the greater body of Christ out there, or is he specifically addressing the Corinthians and what's going on in their assembly? The second, right? He's specifically addressing what's going on in their assembly. So as we think about these verses, we need to think first about them with respect to the local church, okay? And then if there's application after that to be made to the bigger situation, that would be a secondary consideration in my opinion. Okay, based upon what's going on in it, specifically in this passage and the context of what's going on. Now, go back, uh, where did I tell you to go? You back in chapter 1? Chapter 1, verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you. When he says no divisions among you, is he talking about the church at large, or is he talking about in Corinth? He's talking about in Corinth. Okay. Now, certainly, is it ideal that we see all these divisions in Christianity? No, that's not ideal, right? I, that, that's, that's a product, though, of people forsaking the authority that God placed in the Apostle Paul. Okay? But that's just, I'm not really interested in talking about that specifically as I am what's going on here for the Corinthians. So he says that there be no divisions among you. Now drop down to verse 11. He says, For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are what? Does Paul know there's contentions in Corinth? Yeah. The contentions in Corinth are leading to what? Divisions. Okay, look at the next verse. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. So in other words, there's, there's, there's factions that are forming around personalities, around teachers, around different people in the church of Corinth, and the Corinthian, there's contention, there's infighting, and it's leading to what? Division. Does Paul want there to be divisions amongst the Corinthians? No. Come with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Look at chapter 11, look at verse 18. <laughs> verse 18 he says verse 18 he says first of all when you come together in the church I hear that there be divisions among you and I partly believe it so when Paul's beseeching them to speak the same thing and that there be no divisions is he addressing a real time situation and problem that was facing the Corinthian church. 
Now, the word divisions, the English word divisions, carries the following meanings. Number one, the act of dividing or separating into parts. Number two, the state of being divided. Number three, that which divides or separates, that which keeps apart a partition. Next, a separate body of men as communities and divisions of men. Now, you already, you're, go back to chapter 1 if you're not already there. We already know that he's saying to them in verse 12 that some say, I'm a Paul and I'm a Paulus and so on and so forth, right? So are those divisions that are, are those divisions that are, that are being formed around men and personality? Yes, okay. Last definition of division. A part or distinct portion as the division of a discourse. So if you look at verse 10 there, he says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you. Does Paul want divisions amongst the Corinthians? No. One of the things that he's beseeching them to is that there not be these what? Divisions. Coming to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. First Corinthians chapter 12. Now look, are you going, anytime you are dealing with people, are you going to have people that don't always see things exactly the same? Yes. Okay. Are you going to have people that don't always understand every verse in exactly the same way? You know, I look at, you know, bro, bro, Brother Ernie and myself and Craig and, and Nate and some others were talking about a verse just before we started and what we thought it meant. We're not arguing about it, we're just talking about it, okay? And then you, you, you gain understanding that way as you have, as you have dialogue, if, as you have respectful dialogue with other members of the body of Christ over verses, as you talk about things, and as you think about things, right? Not everybody is going to see everything exactly the same all the time, right? That's just a fact. Even, even in an assembly like this that stands for a particular uh, way of approaching and handling the Word of God, there's not exact jot and tittle agreement on every single thing. Okay? Does, is that what Paul's saying we need to have? I don't believe that's what he's saying. If that's what he's saying, then, then you're going to have one little, group, one little group here that's going to become an assembly, another little group here that's going to become an assembly, and, and you're just going to have total chaos. Look at what he says here. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 25, he says that there should be no schism in what? The body, but that members should have the same care what? One for another. The word schism there is a translation of the same word that's translated divisions, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. To have a schism. If something is in schism, it means, in a general sense, division or separation. But appropriately, a division or separation in a church or denomination of Christians, occasioned by diversity of opinions, breach of unity among people of the same religious faith, second definition, separation, division among tribes or classes of people. Now, is Paul, does Paul want there to be division? No. Does Paul want them to speak the same thing? Yes. How in the world is that ever going to happen? How in the world is that ever going to happen in the life of an assembly? Now, you can understand the struggle of trying to teach this in a way that, 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 that captures the sense of what Paul is driving at here. Okay? Some would say, well, what we need to do is we need to just forget the doctrine. And we need to, we need to just lay the doctrine aside, and we need to all just agree to disagree, and we all just need to come together, and we need to all stand together for the lowest common denominator amongst us. Is that what Paul has in mind? No, that's not what Paul has in mind, right? Paul does not envision unity, at the, for, unity that forsakes doctrinal truth. Okay? He does not envision a false unity that is just about everybody singing, holding hands and sitting around the campfire and singing kumbaya over stuff while there are great doctrinal differences that divide. That's not what Paul is talking about. He's not talking about a false unity. He's not talking about an arbitrary unity. He's talking about a spiritual unity. Come with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Not chapter 1. 
chapter 4. <coughs> chapter 4, verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you. Aha! What's he doing? He's beseeching, he's asking that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all loneliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another. How? In love, right? Endeavoring, here it is, to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of what? Peace. Folks, and then he identifies what it is. He says, There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. At a minimum, you need to have, you, we need to maintain the unity of the faith. Okay? We need to maintain the doctrinal unity and the integrity of the Pauline grace message that God Almighty, by revelation of the mystery, committed to the Apostle Paul. Where's the church at large with respect to that? They don't even know what the mystery is. Okay? So Paul is not saying, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul is not saying that, this, that we should avoid, that, that doctrine should be thrown away, laid aside, and not a consideration to avoid division. The divisions he's talking about in this context are divisions that are arising around the cult of personality. Oh, you know, I like this teacher. You know, I, you know, Brian, he's okay, but when Brother Tom preaches, now we got something. Okay. When Brother Craig preaches, you know, Craig, he's, he's, he's better than Tom and Brian. And so what we want is we want, we want Craig to be the speaker, to be, you understand what I'm saying? Okay. Pastor Lee. Whoever it is, right? Personality. <clears throat> now, folks, I understand that human nature is human nature. Right? I'll be the first to confess that when I look at the conference agenda of who's speaking and when they're speaking and what they're speaking about, that I know that there are some of these things that I am more interested in hearing than others. Right? Okay, And one of the reasons is because I know who, in my opinion, does the best in communicating the information, as opposed to when compared to others. But I'm also willing to confess to you that that is a wrong way of thinking about that on my part. I should not be thinking about it that way, should I? So when he's talking here about no divisions... He's not saying that we, don't, that we don't seek to maintain the integrity of our doctrine and we, we, we give that up at all costs. In the context, the kind of divisions he's talking about here are those divisions of personality that are going to seek to uh, create havoc and, and rifts within an assembly of believers. Okay? Now, it's, we need to just be realistic about these things, it seems to me. Come with me, if you would, to uh, Psalm 133. Listen, folks, along those, while I'm on that sort of subject matter, myself and the rest of the board, we are very choosy in who we invite to come in here to speak at a Bible conference. Okay? Number one, we're choosy with respect to the doctrine that that person believes and teaches, and is it, is it in line and does it stand and it, does it jive with where we're at and what we believe and teach here at Grace Life Bible Church? But second, if we're gonna, if we're gonna entreat you to come in and be taught over a weekend, it seems to me that it behooves us to make sure that we get some speakers in here that we know are gonna actually what? Teach us something. Otherwise, we're, otherwise we're wasting each other's time, right? Okay? And so you make decisions, right? And, and you make, you, you, you evaluate, you know, certain things. As I think sometimes about what the topic's gonna be, I, I may have a specific, uh, brother out there who I know would do a very good job with a particular subject matter, okay? And so we'll ask that brother to come and speak on that issue, right? Um, what Paul's talking about here, though, is when you have these divisions that are occurring around personality in the local church. Look at Psalm 133, verse 1. Behold, how good and pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together, how? In unity. Okay? 
One of the functions of this unity, come over to Romans chapter 12. You know what? I'm getting ahead of myself. Get Romans 12 in one hand and get 1 Corinthians 1 in the other. We've got to read the next part of the verse. Forgot to do that. Started moving on to the next point. Forgot to... Verse 10. 1 Corinthians 1.10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you. Now watch, semicolon, but. Is there a contrast here? Okay? So, speak the same thing, number one. Number two, there be no divisions, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same what? Ooh. How are we supposed to be joined together? Perfectly. And we're supposed to be joined together perfectly in the same mind and in the same what? Judgment, okay? Now, come with me if you would to get the other passage, Romans chapter 12, verse 16. There are a bunch of verses in Paul's epistles where he talks about this being of the same mind. Verse 16, he says, Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things... But condescend to men of low estate, be not wise in your own what? Does that verse say that we're to mind the same thing one toward another? Okay, what does it say in 1 Corinthians 1.10? It says that we're to be perfectly joined together in the same what? Mind. That means that my way of thinking about something should be the same as yours, the same as yours, the same as the next person, right? So if we're all thinking and minding the same thing, where will our speech be the same? Will we have division among us? No. Because we're, our mind is going to be fixed on the same thing, the same types, uh, the same ways and processes of thinking. Come with me to Romans chapter 15. Look at verse 5. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to who? Christ Jesus. <laughs> that, purpose and the intent, that ye may with one mind, and here it is again, with one what? Mouth, glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. What I want you to see there is the, the idea of the one mouth and speaking the same thing is a function of the one what? Out of the abundance of the heart, Jesus said, the, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth what? Speaks, right? What, what you say with your mouth is all, very often a reflection of where your what? Where your mind is, what you're thinking on. Come with me, let's look at a few more examples here. Come over to Romans 16. Romans 16. Romans chapter 16, verse 17. Now I beseech you, interestingly enough, another beseeching. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the what? To the doctrine and do what? Well, I, I, let me read the whole thing. Causes divisions and, co divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and what? Avoid them. Folks, if there, are other, if there are other people in other churches out there at large within Christendom that teach that you need to work for your salvation, that you, have to, that, that, that you have to work to get saved or stay saved or prove you're saved, would that be an offense contrary to the doctrine that Paul taught? What is his instruction with respect to that? He says, mark that situation and do what? Now that is Paul telling believers that when they encounter those that are teaching doctrine contrary to what he taught and what was revealed to him through the revelation of the mystery, that, that, that it is acceptable to mark those which are causing division according to that doctrine and do what? Avoid them. The context that he's talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 is not those that are without, it's what's going on where? Within. Folks, is it a Pauline thing to mark those which teach false doctrine and avoid them? According to that verse, it most certainly what? It most certainly would be. 
So, does Paul view the doctrine as being inconsequential to this? Or does he view it as being very consequential? Okay? Coming to Philippians chapter 1. Now, I, I, I'm trying to build all this to a point that I want to close with. Got a few more verses here. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, look at verse 27. He says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come to see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast, how? In one spirit, with one what? Mind, striving together for what? the faith of the gospel. Paul says, if I, if I hear of your affairs, if I come to see you, whether I hear of your affairs, what I hope to hear is three things. That you stand fast in the Spirit, that you do it with one mind, and that you're striving, how? Together, for the faith of what? Faith of the gospel. Drop down to chapter 2, look at verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be what? Folks, what's Paul's joy? What is Paul, when Paul looks at the Philippians, or the Corinthians, or the Romans, or whoever it is, right? When he looks at these assemblies, what would fulfill his joy? What would fulfill the joy of the Apostle Paul, verse 2, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same what? Love, being of one accord, of one what? Understand that what brought joy to the heart of the Apostle Paul is when he looked at the various local churches and he saw them striving together for the faith of the Gospel. When he saw them with one mind and one spirit doing something together, seeking to accomplish God's purpose today in the dispensation of grace, together as a local church, without division, without dissension, minding the same thing, minding that same doctrine. Not with splits of, of, of personality and so forth getting in the way. He says, verse 3, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other as what? Better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of what? Others. Folks, when you, it, when you in the assembly seek to deal, for lack of a better term, treacherously with other saints and you're not direct, and you're not open, and you're, and you're going behind people's backs, and you're doing things, and you're not addressing the problems and the situations in a direct manner, what you're doing is you're sowing the seeds of contention and division within the assembly. If you have a problem with, with myself, or, or the board, or whatever it is, and you tell everybody else other than the people that you have a problem with, is that going to solve the problem? No, and that's not striving together for one mind and one spirit for the faith of the gospel. And Paul is saying is, look, if you want to fulfill my joy, this is what I want to see. Whether I come and see you or I else hear of your affairs, I want you, I want to see an assembly that is working together, minding the same things, laboring together for the faith of the gospel. Come to chapter three of Philippians, look at verse six. That's not the one I wanted. Verse 16, Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind what? The same thing. Come back to 1 Corinthians. Chapter 1, verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak this... I feel like I'm a southerner here. Y'all. That you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same spirit. How does that happen? Come to chapter, end of chapter 2. Come to chapter 2. He says in verse 14, he says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. That's talking about a lost man. 
Verse 15, But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judge of no man. Look at verse 16. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Do all believers have the mind of Christ? Do all believers have access to the mind of Christ? Where do we find the mind of Christ? Right here. Okay? So how, is it, how are we going to mind the same thing? How are we going to walk by the same rule? How are we going to all speak the same thing? If, if, if what we say is spoken out of the mind of Christ in us, will the mind of Christ ever say anything that's not edifying? Will the mind of Christ ever say anything that in Ephesians chapter 4 is bitter or wrath or clamor or evil speaking or malice? Will the mind of Christ in you, in me, ever talk that way? No. Will the mind of Christ in you, in me, um, value and esteem and evaluate people and situations based upon the same standard? Shake your head yes. Okay. Do we all have access to the mind of Christ? So if how are we going to do, go, how are we going to go back to chapter 1, verse 10? How are we going to do what Paul's saying here? How are the Corinthians going to do this? How, when it says here, but I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. That doesn't mean everybody's going to say everything. You know, you have Brother Tom come up here, or Craig, or Lee, or whoever it is, on any given occasion, or any guest speaker, and they will give you, my dad two weeks ago, he will give you doctrine, he will say similar things, he will teach you similar, similar truths but does he say everything exactly the same way I do? No, because it's the mind of Christ in him and through his understanding of the Word and his individual personality and so forth that he brings forth the truth of the Word of God. So is he speaking the same thing in the sense that there's agreement about what's being said and what the standard ought to be? It doesn't mean you all have to say everything exactly what? The same way. And he says that y'all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you. See, if you have, if we all function on the basis of the mind of Christ, and the mind of Christ in each one of us as members of the church, the body of Christ, values and esteems things and thinks about things in the same way, will there be, will there be division in the assembly? Not the kind of division Paul's talking about in seeing and addressing in Corinth, there won't be. Because it's out of the mind of Christ that you're able to speak the same thing, mind the same thing, and deal and make the same... No, well, notice what it says. And that ye, there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same what? Mind. It would be a pretty scary thing if that meant you all had to be like me. Yeah, it would be, wouldn't it, Vicky? <laughs> But that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same what? Judgment. Is the mind of Christ, is God's Word resident in you and in me and dwelling richly in you and in me and effectually working in you and in me? Is the mind of Christ going to value and esteem things the same way in every member of the body of Christ? It's on that basis that we're able to make things and operate based upon the same what? The same judgment. The mind of Christ in a believer looks at things the same way. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying, therefore, that every believer needs to act and look and behave the same way, right? Because Christ in you is going to show... You know, you, you, know what, you know what Paul's saying here? If I could say it this way... He's saying, what would, Christ, what would Christ living in Brian look like? If, if the life of Christ, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, when the life of Christ is made manifest in my mortal flesh, Second Corinthians 4, verse 10, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest where? Where does Christ seek to manifest His life today? In you, in me, in our body. Are we right now the temple of God? Yes. 
The life of Christ is made manifest and put on full display as His life is lived out through you and I as members of the church, the body of Christ. And he says, verse 11, For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest where? I look out and I see a body that has been tempered together by God the Holy Spirit and in a manner that He saw fit to put it together. And I see people that have distinct differences in terms of personality, in terms of ability, in terms of interest, in terms of all sorts of things. And the issue about the mind of Christ and what we're talking about here is not that that mind is going to make everybody little automatons that all act like Brian or anybody else, but it's what would Christ's life look like in Wanda, in Doug, in Diane, in, in, in Tom, or whoever else, right? Because Christ manifesting His life in me or in you isn't going to, it's, it's going to be characterized by the same characteristics but it's not going to look the same because you and I are different. But it's on the basis of that Word of Christ dwelling in you richly, Colossians chapter 3, and that mind of Christ being the way that you think about things and the way that you evaluate things and the way that you esteem things that's going to make, in closing, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, that's going to make this verse possible. Now I beseech you, brethren... By the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same one. Is that what God wants for you and I as members of the church of the body of Christ? It absolutely is. Is that something? How, how, how is that going to be accomplished? That is going to be accomplished to the extent that you and I understand the mind of Christ get His mind in us, and are able to live and function on the basis of that Word living in you. I hope that makes sense to you. That's what Paul is exhorting, beseeching, the Corinthians unto. And next week we'll look at more about what that's about. Heavenly Father, we thank You once again for Your Word. For these saints that have gathered here to hear Your Word preached this morning, we pray that what we've said will be understood. And it won't just be understood in the sense that we've understood it intellectually, but that we'll meditate upon it, ponder it, hide it in our heart so that your mind becomes our mind, so that we can function on that basis. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.